Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. And an opportune time had come, right there in a garden. And they would least expect it. And he would not know it would be coming. In a moment of weakness, in a time of opportunity, Satan, the deceiver, spins his tail. And he tries to tempt your Savior. It wasn't the first time they had met, but now there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Satan tempts Jesus with an easier way. You need not go to the cross. Did God really say you had to, to die to take these people's sins away? There must be an easier way. Pray that the cup would be passed from you. Pray that an easier way would be done. Pray that your will would be done. That's his technique. To take the will of the Father, the word which reveals it, and to twist it. He is the father of lies. Every temptation is born of Satan. Every temptation is born of a twisting of God's word. He does not take God's word and throw it out the window, but rather he says, did God really say? He places into your mind in those moments of temptation the opportunity to interpret scripture, to get into the mind of God, to get at what God really intended for you. Did God really say? Did God really mean what he said? Surely you know. Surely you know how to get at what God really meant. Adam and Eve thought they knew what God really meant. So Satan attacks in the garden of Eden. And he asks Eve, did God really say you may not eat of any tree in the garden? You see, you know Satan is lying because his lips are moving. Do snakes have lips? This one does. And he lies to Eve. Did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Of and Eve says, no, we may eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of that one, we shall not eat. And we, we really shouldn't even touch it. Oh, did God say that? No. See, Eve knew better than God, didn't she? She knew better than God. God had said, don't eat it. But Eve knew better. Eve decided, not only should I not eat it, but I shouldn't touch it either. And then I'm doing even better than what God has given me to do. And she already worships at a false altar. Herself, her knowledge. She knows better than God. You will not surely die another lie. But God knows that when you eat of it, you shall become like him, knowing good and evil. And in a way, he's right. In their eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve knew good and evil. Before their eating, they knew good. Everything God had given them was good. And on the last day, he declared everything was not just good, but very good. They knew good. Good was what was coming from God. Good was what God had provided for them. Good was what they willed, what they desired from God. All this was good. But now they will know good and evil. For they will hear another word and listen and obey. She takes from the tree and eats. Gives some to her husband who is with her and he eats. And they know good and evil. Evil is them. They have become evil and corrupt and sinful. 
and every child born of them, evil, corrupt, and sinful. You daughters of Eve and sons of Adam, bear this heritage in your own bodies, sinful and unclean. Our will is turned against God. And so Satan strikes with temptation. He tempts us with God, with twisting God's word. Did God really say to you, how shall we resist this temptation? Adam and Eve, who were without sin, could not resist against the devil and fell prey to his lies and to his tales. Poor we, of sinful nature and corrupt soul, a will turned against God, how shall we stand in the day of temptation? So Satan tempts and twists and turns the dagger in our hearts to turn us against God. He tempts us subtly, not blatantly. For if he were to come out and simply say, no, it's okay to commit adultery, surely even us in our corrupt wills would know that would be a sin. But what Satan tempts us with is the question, is it really sin? Is it really adultery? After all, it's just electronic. After all, it was just a glance. After all, no one really knows. No one was really hurt. And adultery is committed. He does not come out and say, no, feel free to take what isn't yours. Steal. But rather, he twists it and says, it's not really stealing, is it? They have so much, they don't miss a little more. Your employer doesn't keep very good count. No one's watching. It's not really stealing. It's just borrowing. You'll have it back in time. No problem at all. Or gossip. He does not come out simply saying, go ahead, slander your neighbor. Tell a lie about your neighbor. Make sure everybody knows what a scoundrel they are. But rather, he says, is it really gossip? After all, it's the God's honest truth. You're just telling the truth. And that's a good thing, right? We should tell the truth. But we make sure everybody knows the awful truth. Rather than helping our neighbor, defending them, speaking well of them, leading them out of their sin. Is it really gossip? Or loving your neighbor. He doesn't tempt you to say, no, go ahead, hate your neighbor. Do evil against them. But rather he says, well, you're kind of already loving your neighbor, aren't you? You're doing okay with that loving your neighbor thing. You can let it go. <clears throat> Satan doesn't tempt us by saying, it's okay to worship a false god. But rather he takes God's word and twists it and convinces <laughs> us to worship God falsely, to worship God in our own image, to twist his word, to take out things that are inconvenient, or to neglect the gifts which God gives us. This is how Satan works. He is crafty. Deep guile and great might are his dread arms in fight. Deep guile, to beguile you, to fool you, to trick you, to twist and turn and to misuse the good gifts God has given. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters. Perhaps you've heard of this book. Screwtape is the name of a, uh, a demon who is writing letters to, um, uh, to his nephew, Wormwood, another demon who has been recently graduated from tempting school and assigned a human to tempt. And so you have Screwtape writing letters to his nephew. My dear Wormwood, the enemy he speaks of is Christ. And he says to his nephew, My dear Wormwood, everything must be twisted before it is of any use to us. 
He warns Wormwood against telling lies, but rather encourages him to twist the truth, to convince his charge that he is doing well enough, to go ahead, send him to church, convince him all is well, to lead him away from repentance, to lead him away from contrition, to lead him into false belief and other great shame and vice. You see, this is how the devil works. He twists. And so it is into this mortal nature, into the object of Satan's tempting, that Jesus comes. He became man. He became one of us, tempted. Body and soul, temptation. Hunger, thirst, exhaustion temptation. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we, yet he without sin. Your Lord Jesus Christ takes on our human nature and throws himself into the breach of Satan's tempting. Though Satan prowls around like a roaring lion with his mouth gaping open, seeking you to devour, your Lord Jesus Christ throws himself into the jaws of the lion and shatters them. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, there at his baptism, Jesus goes out into the wilderness to become the new Israel, to become the new Moses, to undo all that has been broken by our sinful nature, he goes out not for 40 years, but for 40 days into the wilderness. Not fed with manna or water from a rock, but eating nothing, drinking nothing. So at the end of the 40 days, he was hungry. The opportune time. Satan comes in to twist and to turn and to tempt. If you really are the Son of God, a false proof. Because whether Jesus does what Satan does, asks him to or not, Jesus is still the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And see how Christ overcomes. Not once, not twice, but three times. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. You shall serve the Lord your God and worship him only, and you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus stands on the field of battle and endures the temptations of Satan in your place. Where Eve and Adam fell prey to the fruit that was desirable to the eyes, good for making one wise, and good for food. Jesus is not tempted by his stomach, nor by the powers of this world, nor by the glory which comes from being Lord over all. He resists, and he stands firm in the face of all these temptations. And in his standing firm, you stand firm as well. So how shall we stand in the day of temptation when Satan comes against us with twisted word and foul tale? We shall stand here in the waters of our holy baptism. I point you here to your baptism. Because Jesus, when he had gone out into the wilderness, was filled with the Holy Spirit, having been baptized. And you go out into the wilderness of this world, wandering though we do, filled with the Holy Spirit, your body as a temple, because you have been baptized. You bear upon yourself the name of the Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The sign of the cross marks your forehead and your heart as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. And so you can stand in the day of temptation, not because you will be free from sin, but because all your sins will be forgiven in Christ Jesus. See, Christ has gone before you through the waters, through the tempting, 
through the death and into the resurrection. And so your life does pass. You have passed through these waters of holy baptism. And you will pass through this time of temptation where Satan will come at you with everything he has to try to convince you that God doesn't love you, to try to convince you that you are unlovable. And in all this, you will resist because you come and you hear God's word. It is written. It is written that you are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is written that God, while we were yet sinners, sent his Son to die for us. It is written that God tempts no one. It is written that with your mouth you confess, with your heart you believe, and you will be saved. So we overcome not by the power of our will, for our will is corrupt, but we overcome with the word of God and with the blood of the Lamb, who has already silenced the tempter, who has already gone to the cross, who has gone through death and into the resurrection, where you shall go also. Yes, we will face death, but we will face it with Christ by our side, our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit. We will face death, but we will meet life. So no temptation can overcome us because our sins will be forgiven. And so when we sing a song like A Mighty Fortress, we sing of our place of refuge in these times of temptation. We sing of the church. We sing of Christ. We sing of his gifts, that our God is our mighty fortress, shielding us against the assaults of the evil one. And the deep guile and great might, his dread arms, avail nothing. With our might, nothing could be done. Soon would our loss be effected. But for us fights the valiant one whom God himself elected. Jesus Christ it is. And so in the day of temptation, you stand united with Christ. Him fighting for you. Him overcoming Satan. Him granting you forgiveness and peace. I hate temptation because it's so easy to slip into it. So I rejoice in my baptism. I rejoice that Christ has united himself with me. I rejoice that because I have sinned, I'm not cast off from Christ, but rather Christ embraces me and forgives me. Satan would try to convince you that every time you sin, God hates you and God wants to turn you away from him and just cast you out and strike you down. But that is far as this from the truth. The words of Scripture tell us that the Father waits for us who wander from him. He embraces us with forgiveness and with love. And so in your time of temptation, when you are overcome and you embrace that sin once again, flee to the cross. Flee to the reality of your baptism. Flee to God's God's word. Flee to his body and his blood. And you are washed clean and made pure again. So during these 40 days of Lent, as you have given something up, as you are fasting, as you are being tempted by Satan in these 40 days and all the days of your life, know that Christ stands with you. And nothing shall overcome him. And so nothing shall overcome you. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.